nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Do you have constitutional questions? Get constitutional answers. We'll be answering your constitutional questions live, so get ready to call in now. Are you a prosecutor, law enforcement officer, or local government employee? Want to make sure you are executing the laws in a constitutional manner? Are you a city council member, township board member, or state legislator? Want to ensure the laws you pass are constitutional? Perhaps you're a citizen who wants to know the proper limits on government and the protections for your God-given liberties. Regardless of your role, call me, Constitutional Attorney Katherine Henry, with your constitutional questions during our live call-in show now at the phone number listed on the screen. And remember, together we can restore freedom. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. What is going on? <laughs> Okay, I guess you guys can hear me, but you can't see me. Not sure what's going on here. Um, you've got to be freaking kidding me. Okay, only this camera works. That's well. Okay, so now I have to adjust everything because we're set up for the wrong camera. Um, well, guys, um, yeah, everything's all messed up. It's been, it's been a week from hell. It's been a month from hell. Um, well, let's see what else I got to do here. Um, there we go. And I was going to share the comments on the screen or the chat on the screen, but um, we'll see if that works. Um, had it set up yesterday. There we go. Okay. So guys, um, I don't know what you guys can see. You'll have to tell me. Um, the screen looks all kinds of messed up. Um, and I'm going to turn off the small chat box because that's stupid. But um, all right, hopefully you guys, you, okay. Buffering. That's awesome. Okay. Because why shouldn't I have technical difficulties? <sighs> well, I guess you guys let me know what you see. Um, on my screen, it just says you are currently sharing your screen, which is not helpful because I know that I'm sharing my screen, but I need you guys to be able to see the screen I'm trying to share. Um, So I don't know, Liberty Warrior, I don't know what you're talking about. You just said can't, takes up two thirds of the screen. Chat takes up two thirds of the screen. Yes, because I wanted to do half and half and it's, this program does not allow me to do that. Um, so you guys are saying chat is up. Okay, good. So I'm not seeing the chat there. Um, I have to have it up in a whole nother, oh, actually, I'll see what you, um, um, Anyway, um, I see a whole bunch of things, questions, uh, let's see, hellos. Um, okay, well, anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Before I turn on that call in now button, um, I do wanna give you guys an update because, um, okay, so yes, it is 11 minutes past the hour. I started it seven minutes late. I'm not sure if that's your point. Um, if you want to give me a hard time, then you want to get to a different uh, YouTube channel. That would be awesome because today is not the day to fuck with me. It's really not. So it's been a few years from hell, actually. 
Um, and as soon as I was done fighting the COVID battle, wasn't even done with that and already had to start dealing with fighting bullshit from the city of Ormond Beach. Uh, who can't figure out how to follow court rules. They can't figure out how to follow the Constitution. They can't figure out how to follow state laws. And they certainly don't know how to follow the ordinances from their own frickin' city. So uh, at any rate, we're all expected to know those, right? Because as you've heard before, I'm sure, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Yes, those of us mere mortals, just plain citizens, are held to that standard. But government officials? Oh, no, ignorance of the law is totally an excuse. They're not held accountable for any standard whatsoever. So, um, yeah, I'm going to be blunt because today, today's not the day to piss me off or mess with me. So here's where I'm at. The update of my case, for those of you who have been following the Ormond Beach case, if not, go to restorefreedomkh.com slash OB case, and you'll be able to see a short video about it. You'll be able to see a way to donate to help us cover the costs of the transcript fees, the filing fees, et cetera. Um, I have to increase that because we just had to pay more filing fees, but, um, at any rate, we, um, and I'm going to bring my screen down a little bit. <clears throat> we, um, uh, so I'm not going to give you a full update about what the case is about, but I am going to tell you where we're at. So most of you uh, in this live chat by now, you already know that we heard from the circuit court last month, and um, it was about a month ago. They um, issued a decision saying that, okay, the city can't physically come on our property and take our pavers, our privacy fence, and the two um, small connexes we have in the backyard. They can't do that. Although she didn't actually talk about, I don't know, the Constitution saying you can't just take somebody's stuff. Anyway, so um, we won on that point. So we the order was an order vacating, or at least partially vacating, the magistrate's um, orders in that regard. However, what she did say is all of my stuff was totally inartful and it was, you know, inarticulate and it wasn't good enough. And um, I wasn't allowed to raise the equal protection argument because I would have to show a standard that does not exist. Um, and I also wasn't allowed to raise the Eighth Amendment argument of cruel, excuse me, well, it is cruel and unusual punishment, but it's excessive fines, um, which I'll talk about in a second, because uh, I didn't raise that argument with the magistrate. <clears throat> There's a few problems with that. Uh, number one is that the magistrate's orders, you're supposed to, under state law 162, uh, chapter 162 of Florida statutes we're talking about, um, 162.07 is where you issue the order that finds violation. 162.09 is where it's another order, a separate, subsequent, distinct, different order that says, okay, well, we issued this other prior order finding violation. We gave them time to comply. And now there's an affidavit or testimony or whatever from the code inspection officer saying that they did not comply. And so now we're issuing an order um, for fines and liens, two different orders. And you need due process with both orders. Oh, yeah. And I found cases or in their language, case law uh, that spells that out. I found loads. I found stuff from the second district court of appeals, third district court of appeals, fourth district court of appeals, fifth district court of appeals and the Florida Supreme Court that acknowledges that you have to do it in these two separate stages. OK, but they didn't do that. No, I only ever had one hearing. That resulted in three orders, one for the pavers, one for the connexes, one for the privacy fence. And it was an order finding violation combined with an order for fines and liens. Immediately was it deemed a lien. Whoa, not OK. So I could not have raised the issue of the fines part because that was not supposed to be a subject of that hearing. In fact, it was not a subject of the hearing and the magistrate did not elicit testimony from either side on any of the statutory factors. If you're wondering what I'm talking about, it's actually a very short statute. You can go to 162.09 um, B or 2B, um, I think it's 2B. And that talks about, it lists the three things you're supposed to look at. Number one is the gravity of the offense. There was no testimony about the gravity of the offense. And oh my gosh, did I murder someone? Did I rape or, or commit arson? No. Did I harm anyone in any way? No. 
We didn't talk about the gravity of the offense, which I'm going to get to in just a minute, because you need to understand this, because you might be facing this in your own municipality, wherever you are, in any state across the country. So we're going to talk about this in a second. So um, I could not have talked about any of those issues because I wasn't given notice and therefore an opportunity to be heard. But I wasn't even given an opportunity to be heard because as soon as he said he issued the order and I was like, whoa, whoa. So you're finding you're doing all that right now. Fines and liens right now in this order. He literally closed out the hearing. Actually, he allowed the um, city attorney to speak, did not give me the opportunity to speak, closed out the hearing. I literally was denied an opportunity to speak on that issue or anything else at that point. So how could I have raised that? I could not. What was I supposed to do? Say, no, Your Honor, you can't close the hearing. Really? That's going to fly? Because she would have wanted me to do that to her in her courtroom when we had oral argument there? No, that's not how it works. So that was the first problem. Um, the second problem is that she then, this is the circuit court in her order on my appeal. She said, well, um, she, at the very, like the very last part where she's talking about why I lose on the Eighth Amendment issue is because you can't raise constitutional issues in front of a magistrate. You can't raise them in an administrative hearing, she said. Well, first of all, that's inherently wrong because the only job a magistrate should have, I mean, they shouldn't exist anyway. There should be no administrative law. There should be no administrative judges or magistrates or anything. It's not constitutional. Only The only judges should be in the judicial branch, which is a whole nother thing. But anyway, so here we are, though, we're in front of a magistrate and he supposedly doesn't have the right to, um, it, you know, it, it, hear the U.S. Constitution issue. So if they're blatantly violating the Constitution, that's OK. He doesn't have authority about that. He only has authority about the state statutes and the codes. Really? OK, but that is what the, the case precedent says. She wasn't wrong that that's what the case precedent says. So the case precedent literally says you cannot raise constitutionally, facially, uh, you know, a facial challenge to a constitution, uh, excuse me, a facial challenge to a state statute saying this law that does this, this and this is unconstitutional on its face. It's unconstitutional. You can't raise that kind of an issue in front of a magistrate. That's what the case precedent says, although it's wrong. Uh, at any rate, there it is. And she recognized that. But what she didn't recognize was the two sentences before the paragraph she quoted from the case law and the whole rest of the next paragraph that she, that, you know, she picked out one sentence, ignored the sentences before and the sentences after. What do those sentences say? Literally, they say, this is too good to not read to you. Oh, I need to, I need to share this with you. Give me a second, guys. It is too good. Yes, here we go, right here. So this is these are the sentences that literally come right after the sentence that she cited. So she said, "You, I wasn't allowed to raise my constitutional challenge in front of the magistrate. She meant at all, in administrative proceedings. She said, I can't raise it at all. So if you have an administrative hearing at all, you're not allowed to raise an, an issue where they violated the US Constitution because the Constitution doesn't apply? What? No, that's actually not what the case precedent says. So the very next sentence, they're saying, yeah, you can't raise it in an administrative proceeding. But they say, we do not mean to imply that the Wilsons is the case. It was the people in that case were the Wilsons. We do not mean to imply that the Wilsons could not have raised their facial challenges in an appeal to the circuit court of the order imposing fines. No shit, that's exactly what I was doing. I had an order, I had a facial challenge in my appeal to the circuit court on the order imposing fines. Huh, just like what they were saying, we did not mean to imply that they couldn't have done that. Section 162.11 of Florida statutes provides for an appeal of these orders, which can be held to the proper, which has been held to be the proper forum to address constitutional claims. So they're saying this court, what she cited, but she only cited parts of it, it says the only place you can raise these constitutional claims is in the circuit court, which is what I did. 
So she said, I waived my right to raise the Eighth Amendment issue because I didn't bring it in front of the magistrate who denied me due process and the ability to be heard on that issue anyway. But secondly, I wasn't even allowed to do it there because I had to bring it to her. And she said, no, you can't bring it to me first. Lovely. In fact, they cited another case from the Third District Court of Appeals that says, holding that appeal under section 162.11, we're talking about the very same statutes I, I'm, I have in my case, was, proper, was the proper forum to raise both a facial and an as-applied challenge to the code enforcement procedure. Accordingly, the court says, the Wilsons could have raised their constitutional challenges on appeal to the circuit court. So guess what? You can. You can raise constitutional challenges when you are appealing to the circuit court. That's not the only thing that's wrong. That's not the only thing that I want to appeal. The problem is right now, in order to appeal, you only get in many jurisdictions, you only get one right to appeal. If you want to appeal that decision any further, then you need to ask the court's permission. Now that's done in a variety of ways. In Michigan, it's called through a leave to appeal. So you file an application for leave to appeal. You are asking the court to give you permission to file your case, essentially. Now in Florida, uh, the procedure is a petition for writ of certiari or petition for writ uh, or a petition for writ for cert. Okay. So again, still asking the district court of appeals here to take on my case because they don't have to unless certain things are met. Now, one of the things is that if it's a miscarriage of justice and I have no other rights to appeal anywhere, this is a miscarriage of justice where she is plucking out parts of cases and ignoring the whole context of the case. That's a problem. And that happened in multiple situations throughout the thing. So here we are today. I had 30 days from rendition. That is filed and served and all that other fun stuff. And so I filed and served it. Um, excuse me, they filed and served it on me on March 7th. So I had until yesterday to file it. I filed it the day before on April 7th. So yesterday morning, I get an email that they are rejecting, they accepted the petition, but they are rejecting the appendix and the transcript, which I'm required to put in there because I have to reference those things. The appendix, for those of you who don't know, an appendix is the collection of all the exhibits. So all the prior court orders and your briefs and the exhibits that were entered at the trial court level, that's it all goes into an appendix. And it all has to be um, consecutive, consecutively paginated, okay? So um, they have a standard for technological guidance or whatever it's called that I made sure I was reading the most current version available on the Florida Supreme Court's website. And it says that you cannot upload through the e-filing system any document over 50 meg. Guess what? The appendix, the original appendix was just under 50 meg. But if I added the new uh, circuit court ruling and all of my uh, brief on appeal, the city's answer brief and my reply brief, guess what? It's over 50 meg. So what does that mean? It means that according to their standards, I had to do two different ones. I had to number them differently. So you have to match the page numbers in your appendix to what the PDF viewer says. So it's not like it's just, okay, well, I'll, I'll start if I ended here on page 127, the new one will start on page 128 and then we'll go from there. Oh, no, no, because the viewer has to match. So I had to start over. So appendix page number one or appendix number two, page number one, appendix two, page number three, et cetera. So that's what I did. Now there's another court rule that says the transcript has to be separate from the appendix. That's what I did. So I had uploaded them three separate PDFs to support my petition. So yesterday I got the email that they were accepting the petition and rejecting the other three documents, which I have to have, I have to submit those. So I asked them what the issues were. And um, the main issue they said is that they all have to be part of one PDF. And I said, well, it says that you have a 50 meg limit. And they said over the phone, oh no, we have a 150 meg limit. We have people submitting appendix appendices that are you know, over a thousand pages. Okay, well then you guys should update the standards that are 
you know, put there with the court rules. So we know that because I purposely separated them because of those standards and because of the court rules. And they said that transcript needed to be part of the appendix. And I'm like, that's not what the, you know, what the court rule says. Oh, but that's what we want you to do here. Okay. I will do that. So what did I do yesterday? I spent hours, not just recombining and having one appendix, that then had to have all the page numbers adjusted so that it's one continuously paged, paginated uh, PDF. I had to update the index because those all have to you know, match and whatnot. And I just realized I probably did not update the index pages. I'm gonna make myself a note, guys. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, so I had to do all that, but then I had to go into the, the brief itself, the petition, and I had to find every single time that I referenced Appendix 1, Appendix 2, or the transcript, and I had to change it so it just said Appendix and had its new page number. So I had to figure out what the new page number was going to be. That took me hours. And Mike and I, I worked on it for a while. Then when Mike got home from work, he helped me and we went through and then we re, you know, we updated the index page to show the proper page numbers and all that stuff and updated the cover page because there was no longer three separate documents, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Okay. Then um, there was also a notice of constitutional challenge that's required. So let me tell you this. In, in several states, this is the case. So it's not just Florida, but in Florida in particular, look at the Florida Rules of Appellate Procedure 9.425. 425? For, um, one second. Yes, 425. What it says is if you are challenging not just how they applied a law to you, like an equal protection thing is how they applied it to you, I'm also challenging that. But if you challenge whether it's constitutional on its face, for example, the fact that the orders say that they are going to fine us every single day, $75 a day for all eternity, it will never end. I'm saying that's unconstitutionally excessive under any standard. Okay, so that is not something about how they're applying it. That's literally the, the face of the law allows that to happen. So I didn't challenge it initially in that regard because I didn't realize that the circuit court judge was going to hold that that's what the state law basically requires. So given the context of her ruling, I now have to challenge the constitutionality of the underlying state statute, okay? 162.09 in case you're interested. Other people have done this as well, just so you know. So, in fact, they have literally taken people's homes in a foreclosure action. They've taken their properties and then even tried to sue them for the remaining difference. Yeah. So they're like, at this point, you owe us $600,000 uh, and we're going to foreclose on your house. We're going to sell it for $99,000, even though the market says it's worth at least four eighty, dollars And then we're going to sue you for the $500,000 difference. Oh, yes, that's currently happening in the state of Florida. In fact, the Michigan, excuse me, the Florida Supreme Court was asked to look at that very issue um, just this year. They were the, a petition was filed in December on a case DJB Rentals. It was filed by Christina Martin, who is with the Pacific um, Legal Foundation, Pacific Justice Foundation, whatever you guys can figure it out. Um, and she's actually the one who argued and won a unanimous verdict in the Tyler v. Hennepin County case in the United States Supreme Court last summer, which came out a week before my initial brief was due. And that's a case I cited in my brief just that week later. Anyway, so she is the attorney on this case, um, the DJB Rentals case, that they were asking the Florida Supreme Court to weigh in. Now, they did not file a timely appeal initially. And so <clears throat> they, um, the Supreme Court turned down taking the case based on that procedural hiccup, if you will. So it sucks. I don't think it's a just outcome, but it doesn't have any bearing on my case 
because I met the deadlines. I appealed and technically they didn't even issue the orders for fines appropriately yet. That still has never happened because there's been no subsequent order from the magistrate. Anyway, so um, lots of things going on here. Um, at any rate, um, I, oh, constitutional challenge. That's what I was telling you guys. So 9.425 says that if you challenge the constitutionality of a statute, I'm gonna continue to move my desk down because this other camera is stupid. Anyway, and I'm looking at the wrong camera. So my bad guys, I'm used to looking at the one that's supposed to be working and it's not working right now. So at any rate, the, um, uh, in this rule, it says if you are challenging the facial constitutionality of a state statute, you have to file what's called a notice of constitutional question, where you're saying, what is the question? Is this particular statute constitutional? You know, is it unconstitutional as an excessive fine against the Eighth Amendment or whatever? Okay, it's very simple. It's a one page document. And you have to serve that on the state attorney general. Okay. So with that being said, that is exactly what I did. So yesterday, once we got the updated appendix, and then I had to have an updated petition because it referenced all the wrong page numbers then, otherwise, um, then I had the notice of constitutional question and I was filing them all together. This morning, I get a notice that my appendix is rejected again and that my notice of constitutional question is rejected. No reason given. So I call and the court says, well, there's, there was a reason. They said the, the attorney general is not a party to this case. And so I called and I said, okay, about that. Um, it literally says rule 9.425 says that um, a party who files a petition drawing into question the constitutionality of a state statute at the time the document is filed in the case shall, it's not like I'm wanting to, this is a requirement, one, file a notice of constitutional question stating the question and identifying the document that raises it. And two, serve that notice and the copy of the petition on the attorney general. So she puts me on hold. She reads that. She comes back. Well, it's not a criminal case. I said, no, this, this isn't a criminal case. Well, the attorney general is not a party to your case. I said, no. How do I comply with this, with this court rule then? Well, I don't know. I'm not an attorney. I can't tell you that. Okay. <clears throat> she said, you could just re resubmit it if you want. I said, okay. And she said, and then maybe we'll be more specific when we reject it again. Why would you reject it? It's required. And she just went in a circle. That's all we kept talking about was that it's not a criminal case. So the state attorney general is not a party to the case. So they're prohibiting me from filing that document in the Fifth District Court of Appeals that I am required to file. So if you go look as a public record, you can go search for um, on the Fifth District Court of Appeals website, the my Florida Access or whatever the, the court thing is, court file 24-0915, 240915. All you'll see is the petition, and then they have a letter acknowledging that I filed the petition, and then you'll see an amended petition. That's all you'll see, at least as of the time we went live, because they rejected the other ones. Now, so in my phone call about the appendix this morning, I'm like, why is that rejected? You don't have all the bookmarks um, properly identified. I said, what are you talking about? We went in there. They wanted them more specific. So when I said March 2023 orders of the special magistrate, they wanted them to say orders finding violation. OK, and then I had um, the one of the notice of hearings that they sent me in December 2023 or 2022. And then I had the two um, things from the post office, like where they had sent it certified mail. And that was just with it. They wanted those separately bookmarked. And then all those new bookmarks have to be added to the index. Wait, what? 
I said, well, what else do you want? Well, I can't tell you that. You just have to go through and make sure everything has a bookmark. And I said, well, it does though. These are sub pieces. So what are the sub, I'll, if you want the sub parts to have a separate bookmark, you tell me which ones and I'll add it. But otherwise, what do you want me to do? Put a bookmark on every page? So she would not tell me. She said, I can't go through the whole thing and tell you which ones. Okay. So I did my best to update that. Then she said the page orientation was messed up. I went and looked through the whole thing and I didn't see that. So she's on the phone and she says, well, like, for example, this is in all the places, but this is one of them. And she points to page 89. You guys can look at it. It's on my website too. Um, I The new version that has um, the uh, updated bookmarks is not on my website yet, but uh, you'll still see the same page number. So page 89, you'll see in the court, in the magistrate's original orders, all three orders, at the end, he has two pictures for each that he has as exhibits. And that file of the entire order, I got as an electronic copy from the city clerk. I did not scan that. That was from the city clerk because they're required to turn it into an electronic file. And then I'm allowed to have access to it in order to put it together for the record. So I didn't do anything with the PDF and the circuit court never told me there was anything wrong with it. But because the pictures were normally, uh, they were taken as a landscape picture. And when they were printed as part of the packet by the city inspection person, the neighborhood improvement division, she had them turned so that they could be as big as they possibly were on the page, which meant that they were then landscape on the paper. So that when you look at it in the PDF viewer, you have to go like this to see it. That's what she's talking about. I had to turn them. And I said, quite honestly, I don't know how to do that because I've never had to do that. She's like, well, they're your pictures. And I'm like, they're not my pictures. They're from the court. So anyway, and I, she's like, well, you do it in Adobe um, Acrobat. And I said, I don't have that program. Not, I don't have a paid version of that program. How many people in the United States can afford expensive software? with paid versions of things. There are many people that can't afford those paid versions. Most people, if anything, have a viewer. Now I do have um, a different kind of PDF uh, editor, but it's not Adobe. But at any rate, we were able to fix those orientations. Mike was, I, I literally, I, I, don't, I don't cry about a lot of things. I was crying. I was even crying on the phone with the fricking court clerk today. Um, I called Mike. I could not even speak for the first two minutes on the phone call. I just cried on the phone to my husband, who I knew was getting ready to step into a meeting. And he had just taken a week of vacation days, not that we got to do anything fun. We we're dealing with this append appendix and the petition and all that, the appeal. But anyway, if I call my husband, call him, and I'm starting by crying, things are bad. By the way, this is why I look like shit today, okay? This is why I literally had just gotten out of the shower, have no contacts, just glasses, no makeup, threw whatever shirt on I could because I needed to start this show and that's why I was seven minutes late. So anyway, this was all morning we were trying to work on this. So he came home from work after his, the last morning meeting and, um, and tried to help me finish the rest of this. And one of the things is apparently in Adobe, any Adobe programs, the transcript showed up as a bunch of dots. Now, in my viewer, it was just fine, but the transcript shows a bunch of dots. So anyway, I ended up contacting the initial court reporter to see if she could change the font because that's what we determined the issue must be. I'm contacting my dad, a computer guru, because he has Adobe Acrobat, at least viewer on his computer. And so he could at least see what they see because they wouldn't tell me what exactly they were seeing or send me a screenshot. So I have something to work with. And so he shows me the error code. Uh, well, Mike showed me the error code because he at work had that uh, program and he was able to open it. So at any rate, uh, we figured out in the end how to do it where we can, um, I can't just change the font. I mean, I didn't have it as a Word doc. It came as a PDF from the court reporter. And if I just somehow convert it OCR and change the font, it would change the page numbers, which I don't have the mental capacity to go and update all that and find all those again. I mean, that would be insane because um, I just did that yesterday when we changed from transcript numbers to appendix numbers. But at any rate, uh, we were finally able to figure it out, I think. 
and we were able to test it with Adobe Acrobat Viewer and the dots seem to be disappeared. And so I have refiled as of right before we went live today, the notice of constitutional question, which I'm required to do, and this appendix, which now has the additional bookmarks they have requested, which then required me to put in a, a new updated index page, which required me to make sure all the Bates numbering was correct. Um, and I turned the pages so that you don't have to turn your head when it comes to those pictures. Um, and the pictures themselves aren't even things I reference in my brief, but they were part of the order. But anyway, um, and I was able to figure out a way that their crappy viewer now can hopefully see the transcript that I had no control over and did not create. So access to courts, huh? We have a constitutional right in this uh, state, in the state of Florida. You have a constitutional right of access to the courts. Um, give me a second here, guys. I am getting messages from the team behind the scenes here. Um, Gabriel, I guess, I don't know where the comment came from because I haven't been, I'm going to be honest, I haven't remembered to check in at the comments in the last several minutes. Um, apparently said, some sort of comment with no makeup needed. And I really appreciate that. Um, I mean, it's it's not what this is all about, but just somebody being kind to me right now is enough to make me tear up because they weren't very kind to me on the phone today at the court. Um, they, they literally said to me at one point, well, I said, well, can you please tell me what it is that I did wrong here? so that I can correct it and do it however you would like it. Because I did it according to this court rule. So how would you like it to be done? Well, we'll just try to be more specific when we reject it the next time. That was literally the answer she gave me. Now, I'm a tough person. I'm one of the strongest people that I know. I don't mean to be all like this, but I'm also one of the smartest people I know. I work hard. And I read every rule and statute. I don't even just read the court rules, guys. I read every comment and, and court commentary for the court rules. Yes, after, after each court rule, there is sometimes several pages of commentary from either the committee that drafted it or from the court itself, of the Supreme Court in your state, on why they changed that rule the way they changed it at the time. So I read 40 years or 50 years of comments for all the changes they've done in that time. Yes, that's what I do. So it's not like I'm being lazy here, but they weren't being very kind and they weren't being very understanding. So at any rate, um, that's where we're at with my appeal. Uh, there are essentially three ways that I can actually have my appeal move forward. One is if the court clerk themselves, in fact, I'm going to skip to my notes so I can make sure I'm telling you exactly what the options are here. Um, Okay, so the court clerk might order Ormond Beach to file a response. Would they do that? I'm going to guess not because apparently they don't like me or like my case or whatever. I, I've ticked them off somehow. Um, <clears throat> so if that doesn't happen, then I have a second opportunity. And this applies anybody... Now this part specifically is Florida. And um, I'm gonna be even more specific. I don't know if this applies anywhere out of the fifth district court of appeals or if this only applies to the fifth district court of appeals, not sure. But this just gives you at least a kind of understanding of, of how the things work, the, the man behind the curtain, okay? So that you have an understanding of what you're up against. 
So um, if the court clerk does not order Ormond Beach to file a response, my next chance at having this case accepted by the court, not, not winning it, just accepting it, is if the central staff, um, who I think that means they're staff attorneys, okay? If the central staff, then they might decide to um, order them to show cause, order Ormond Beach to show cause why my writ of cert shouldn't be granted, meaning they might say to Ormond Beach, listen, show us a good reason why we shouldn't allow this case to be considered. Okay, so that's the staff attorneys. They might do that. If that doesn't happen, then it gets assigned to a three judge panel. Now, it takes at least a majority of the three judge panel to determine who wins the case, but just to decide whether they are going to consider the case, all it takes is one judge if they want to order Ormond Beach to file a response. So the court clerk, the central staff attorneys, or any one of the three judges on the merit panel may essentially order Ormond Beach to file a response in some way, which gets it that closer to getting actual consideration of the merits. That's what it takes just for me to have my case accepted then of course i have to then jump the hurdle of winning on hopefully all of these issues because they're all important and they all affect people but we'll see okay so um i'm gonna look here um wow you guys have been awesome lighting up the comments but there's so many, I don't want to like take the 20 minutes to read them all. I'm just trying to see. I don't see any questions. Um, okay. So I'm not seeing any questions for me. If you have a question for me and I, I missed it, through all the chat, because sometimes you guys are just going back and forth talking to yourselves, which is great. But if there's something specific for me I have not addressed and I overlooked it, I'm sorry. Send it again, please. Um, okay. I do see um, somebody has a 2A question about a Michigan case. Hold on one second. Um, so the attorney general is out. I'm not sure what the question on that is. If you're asking about my, um, now here's the thing, at least the attorney general has been served. So the way their system works, as soon as I upload it, I get an email saying, okay, you filed some documents. We know that we'll process them later. Then within minutes, I get an email that's e-service and it doesn't just send it to me. It sends it to um, the magistrate, the circuit court judge, um, the attorney general um, and the city, the attorneys for the city and me and Mike. So anytime there's a document filed or served, it, it gets, it goes to those people and they get the email. Now, after that is when the court processes it. And that's when they decide if they're going to docket the entry or not. So my, um, my appendix and my, um, uh, notice of a uh, certified or a uh, constitutional question, as, as far as I know right now, have not been docketed or accepted by the court. But yesterday, they were both um, served on all those people I just mentioned because I have physically added all of them to make sure because the court rule requires that I include the circuit court and the, and the other court rule requires that I include the, the attorney general. So, um, and if you challenge a constitutional issue, if you challenge a state statute, um, then say it's not constitutional in some way, uh, the state attorney general, if you go to their website, you can look for contact us. That's what I did. And they literally, the very first thing, if you have a constitutional question, serve us at this email address. That's what we've, we've designated a whole email address just for the constitutional questions. That's what I used. So they know about this and it says in civil cases, mind you, but um, at any rate, the um, 
if the court doesn't allow me to file it, I don't know what to do because I've attempted now twice, three times to file that notice of constitutional question. And it was rejected um, at least the first two times. Um, and the appendix, I, I mean, I have to file that too. So I don't know. At least the people that need to see it uh, are able to see it, except, of course, for the people making decisions at the new court. Um, okay, so somebody is asking me a question, though. Um, if I have an attorney and submit documents myself, can the court overlook my documents? The general rule is yes, because if you have an attorney, so generally speaking, there's only supposed to be one person on a case that's doing your filing. So if you have co-counsels, if you have multiple attorneys, generally speaking, only one of them is really supposed to do the filing because it can get confusing and you're not really sure who's supposed to speak for someone. And it does undermine what the attorney is doing if a client is filing their own stuff. I mean, as an attorney, I would not want that to be because if a client's filing stuff and it's not going through me, then most likely I don't know about it. And then if I don't know about it and we go to court, it might have procedurally screwed us over and the client didn't even realize the implications of what they filed. So, and then I could be held responsible because, sorry, looking at the wrong camera, guys. Um, if I could be held responsible for that. So the, the rule in that sense makes sense. Now, specifically in Florida, I could tell you, I did see it recently that there's a procedure. It might be an internal procedure, but there was something that if, um, if a party files their own documents, the court clerk is directed to immediately contact the attorney for the party if they have an attorney. Um, so beyond that i don't know if there's a specific court rule other than like a policy or procedure um but hopefully that answers your question if you if you don't think your attorney is advocating for your best interests then you can fire your attorney you're not bound to have that attorney now you might ask to be your own attorney or you might um get another attorney so that would be a substitution of counsel or you might have a motion to withdraw your counsel. Um, so, you know, those, and those are Michigan terms. I don't know if, I mean, they should be similar in other states as well. Um, but you can, if you're with your motion uh, to withdraw, you might want to submit, and there's these other pleadings that I need to file a, a request for discovery or a motion for, um, you know, a motion to compel whatever. Um, these things that my attorney is not doing and a motion to dismiss, something like that. And so if that's the case, then if I were you, I would file a motion to get rid of your attorney. And then in that motion, I would reference the other documents and I would attach the other documents as exhibits and say, if the court should grant this, these are the motions I would then like it to file. So, um, but you should be able to file a motion for withdrawal or something to get, to sever that attorney-client relationship. Um, okay. Um, okay, so hopefully, it's funny, I see somebody joining that says they're a, a pro se advocate. That's literally what I, that's the sole purpose of what I'm doing. I mean, you know, if other attorneys want to learn something great, if, if you're a government official and you want to learn the right way to do something, awesome. But really, I know the bulk of people I'm going to be helping are people that are representing themselves. Um, so I guess I'm a pro se advocate as well. So um, anyway, okay, so. Mitten State Media, can you recommend a good attorney in the Genesee County area, one that would be good at 2A situations? Um, shoot. Who is it? There was an attorney in, I believe it was in the beginning of 2020, that had been working on Second Amendment issues that seemed like they were good on that, but I can't remember who it was. I came across them through 
mutual friends. I don't know if it was somebody like Tom Barrett, um, because at the time he was president of, of Michigan Open Carry. No, I think it was Michigan Coalition of Responsible Gun Owners, I think, was the plaintiff. And I can't remember the name of the guy that I was dealing with, but it was the he was the named um client. He he was the the party, the named party in the case. Um oh boy. But I I mean search Michigan Coalition of Responsible Gun Owners and ask them because I think whatever t attorney they had on that case, he seemed to be good. I just don't remember enough of the details. And I want to say that was around the Genesee County area. Um, I believe, uh, for those of you who don't know, it'd be the Flint water crisis. Yeah, that's Genesee County. Um, so I, I believe that's where it would be. Um, Rodney, you think you went to school with someone a long time ago. I'm curious, who did you go to school with? Me or are you talking to somebody else? Um, okay, let's see. Um, okay. Court clerk, Wanda says on YouTube, the court clerk denied court case info repeatedly and you were trespassed two times from the court clerk's office. Well, it's the same kind of issue as when you have COVID and I am not medically able to wear a mask and Allegan County was bringing a case against me and yet I wasn't allowed to physically go in the Allegan County court clerk's office to file my motions and things like that or file my appeal and they didn't have an online system set up yeah yeah it's the same kind of kind of concept where they're just trying to deny you access i don't have easy answers for you on that cover your butt always file motions and file whatever you need to file exhibits and and keep copies of emails with the court staff um whatever you need to do record phone conversations um and so you can attach it as an exhibit if you need to show that's what you're doing um okay how far can a petition go oh that kind of a petition um okay so rodney is saying class of 95 in south haven if you're talking to me i did not go to any schools in south haven and i didn't graduate from anything in 1995 um i'm only 40. So um, anyway, that would not be me, but maybe you're talking to somebody else. Okay. Um, and okay, I don't see any other questions. I mean, okay, so Nick, sorry. Nick says, how far can a petition go? Example, if 20 million people petition to remove Biden, then what? It depends. The pet a petition itself in many contexts can't do, now, not a petition like the one I just submitted for court. That's a legal petition but if you're talking about a petition that's just people want to see change and it's it's like a social action petition um that typically doesn't have legal bearing on its own but it is very important for public policy purposes because if you have a legit 200 million voters that it, that want something done in a federal level and they're letting their congressman know and they're letting their governor know and they're letting their you know whatever they're letting people know then they they know oh my goodness that's a lot of my constituency that wants this done and they're more likely to feel the pressure so it just depends so for example if i was ever given i don't know opportunity and notice to be heard on an order being issued for the fines in my case a petition from my neighbors for example wouldn't have any legal weight however if i have a petition of my neighbors that you know they've all signed saying that they were not harming their property in any way and they actually value the things that we've put in here then i would plan to submit that as evidence of a factual nature to show um you know how we're not harming people and what the gravity of my offense is and um so i would submit it that way so a petition in the sense that you were talking about nick um, doesn't necessarily have legal weight on its own, but it can be used in strategic ways for good purposes. Um, okay, so 
when will the court respond to your new filing today? Jay Curvett, and thank you for your recent donation and um, support. I really appreciate it. Um, I don't know. Uh, this court seems to be a lot quicker than the circuit court when it comes to going through filings. In fact, if you guys want to be patient, um, I'm going to check to see. I did get a uh, response from them. Okay, so the appendix, I keep looking at the wrong camera because I my new camera isn't working. Sorry, guys. The appendix has now been accepted. Thank God. But my notice of constitutional question was not docketed. They're calling it an unauthorized submission. Um... And they have no no notice, like there's no note with it. I guess they're not being more specific about rejecting it. So I don't know. To me, they can't say I didn't try because I've tried multiple times now. I've tried three times to file that notice and they have rejected it all three times. So it is what it is. But um, anyway, that's to answer your question, but at least my appendix let me double check that i'm reading that email right i mean i want to triple quadruple check appendix was accepted okay so whew. um okay and let me see yes a week from today yeah a week from today i will be on the high noon show um generally specific the handle generally specific is commenting on that i will be on their channel um i don't unless i missed it in the chaos of my appeal i don't recall seeing um any specifics like if you were if you set it up to be on your channel and all that fun stuff and you found out how you were going to invite me to join that and all that other stuff so if you haven't done that um then let me know because i um, need the info to be able to join. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So I think generally specific is saying they have a show called high noon and that's what I'll be joining. Lori doesn't quite know that Lori has been busy dealing with her mom and some other stuff and helping me with, uh, getting my um, index for the, the cases and all that stuff ready for this appeal. Um, so anyway, I'm just checking uh, in response on, oh, it just, it just jumped. Sorry guys. Um, okay. So what is the next step? <laughs> yes, you can, <laughs> you should keep your bodily appendix right where it is. That's for sure. Um, Okay, so what is the next step I was asked? Uh, in my appeal, the next step, actually I'll tell you exactly what they are. As far as the notice, the constitutional notice, I don't know, I really don't know. I, I've i tried to file it. Um, I mean, what's the court gonna do? Tell me, say I can't, you know, my case has to be closed because I didn't miss that step because I have proof that I've submitted it three times. Um, so I'm fine with that. I have to file a motion for stay with the circuit court because I have to go back to the, the last court I was in and say, I need you to push pause so that they can't file liens and levies on my real and personal property. Yes, all of our things. They think they're going to lean and levy and take and seize. So um, I need to file that motion for stay. Um, I need to file a motion for oral argument in the um, Fifth District Court of Appeals. There's benefits other than just getting to possibly have your case argued, like verbally argued, because, uh, I, I mean, it can. some people will do better by hearing it. And if they can question me and I can answer their questions, if they, you know, thought of something in a certain way and they're like, well, what about this? And then I could say, oh, yes, 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 because this, this, this is that. You know, I'm good at doing that as long as their questions make sense within the context of the Constitution. But anyway, that's a 
comment for another day. Um, so there's other benefits though, because if it's an oral argument case, then it follows a different track in the state of Florida anyway, at least in the fifth district court of appeals. And it gets um, considered in a formal conference by that three judge appellate panel. And that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the most formal, the most conversation, the most discussion on these issues possible. And then if I don't get the stay, I will have to file a motion for stay with the district court. If that doesn't work, I'm also going to file a motion for an expedited appeal. Um, what I also did is I reached out to two attorneys yesterday. One is um, an attorney who's just one county over who, you know, 25 years ago challenged this very statute in the fifth district court of appeals but the manner in which he challenged it they said it wasn't the time or place to do that and so i wanted to see if he would file an amicus brief on this and i have not been able to hear back from him the other person though um, that i contacted was christina martin the attorney from the pacific legal foundation or whatever their title is um who was the attorney on the DJ Rentals case down here, but also the attorney for the Tyler v. Hennepin County case that she won unanimously in the United States Supreme Court just last year. And so the case down here that she had, um, again, same exact statute, 162.09. And um, I've asked her in a conversation yesterday if she would be interested in filing an amicus brief on any of the issues, but specifically um, on this part of 162.09. And she sounded very interested and is going to take a look. I sent her the briefs and the appendix and everything yesterday. So um, anyway, that is that. And um, pray for me that she is remains intrigued and um, decides to go ahead and jump in on an amicus brief at this time. So that would be awesome. If you know any other cases, excuse me, any other attorneys that um, are interested in these types of issues that you think might want to file an amicus brief, go to my website, restorefreedomkh.com slash OB case. And you can see the individual links for the petition and the appendix and all that that I just filed uh, in the Fifth District Court of Appeals. I added those to the website yesterday and it's towards the bottom because it's all chronological and send them those two links and say, can you get in on this action with an amicus brief? I believe they only have 10 days to file one at this point. So please help me do that and send people that information. Um, okay, sorry, there's been a lot going on. Whew. Okay, I'm not seeing questions. Um, Am I familiar with trust laws? They have changed significantly since I stopped doing basic estate planning in Michigan. So as far as trusts go, I'm not willing to um, put my toe in those waters. Uh, unfortunately, I don't feel like I would be adequate to answer any questions uh, for Michigan trusts in that regard. Um, and let's see. um oh it just dang it okay jay curvett says what about contacting the institute of justice we did do that at the onset of this case and they never responded mike actually mike and Lori, i think tried multiple times um actually Lori, um if you'd be willing or or um mike if you're listening or um jeff if you're listening any of the three of you maybe all three of you any of you, any of you listening, if you want to contact the Institute of Justice and ask them to get involved and, and send them the link to the to the brief um, on my website, that would be phenomenal. I would really appreciate that. Um, I As soon as I'm done here, I will be um, working on those other motions, like I mentioned. But um, anyway, um, yeah, so is 2AEDU? Oh, he's here! Hey, how's it going? I miss you. Um, anyway, uh, you were supposed to come and visit down here, I thought, at some point. And I know you didn't like the hot weather, so I was expecting you to come and visit while it's still cold in Michigan. So get down here quick. Um, anyway, um, let's see. 
um, free, free speech cases. Um, I mean, I've definitely worked on free speech cases, that's for sure. Um, the first free speech case that I remember filing specifically a claim on was actually when I sued the city attorney for this, or the city manager of the city of Belding in 2015. Um, and some of those documents might be on my website. Otherwise, they're um, in PACER if you have federal government court access, or you could just go make a free PACER account. Um, but um, anyway, I will eventually put them on my website if I haven't yet. But obviously, I've been starting with the, the more recent ones first and kind of working backwards. Um, okay, so give me a second. I'm going to jot down... Um, okay, good. Yes, 280, you come on down. Um, know Your Rights is asking me if I'd be interested in taking a case in Michigan. <clears throat> I would love to take a case in Michigan, but right now I have my hands full. I'm going to be honest, have my hands full with this uh, appeal. And then I'm also standby counsel for a freedom fighter and good friend of mine, um, down here in the federal district courts here in Florida, in which I'm not licensed, but he somehow managed to get me admitted pro hoc vice for his case without me even asking. <laughs> so um, I'm just his standby. Um, I would love to help. Um, if you have a question about the case you want to ask me now or in two weeks when we come back and do the show at 7 p.m. or another, you know, the first, uh, second Tuesday of the month where we come back at noon, I mean, by all means, I will help in whatever way I can. And of course, Michigan cases, I'm going to know more specifics because that's where um, I've been licensed the longest. Um, so I think I have gotten through all these questions. Can I refer anyone in Michigan on a 2A case? Quite honestly, I'm going to suggest that you um, maybe see if 2AEDU, if he's still in the chat, if he knows of an attorney that he trusts. Because if he trusts an attorney on a 2A case, I would trust the attorney on a 2A case. Um, but I don't personally know. The only attorney that I was thinking of is someone I can't even think of the name. I can't think of the law firm. And my best connection was that it was somebody that was working with Michigan Coalition for Responsible Gun Owners, but then that was in a case in 2020. Um, and 2AEDU might even know about that. I'm not sure. Um, okay. Uh, federal question and subject matter. Okay. Catherine, is federal question and subject matter the only avenues in lower court? Honestly, I don't know what you mean by that question. I'd love to answer it, but you might have to rephrase that for me. Um, and good, 2A EDO does know a couple of good ones. Um, okay, so my local county's code enforcement now leaves me alone since the USPS code, since the USPS Office of Inspector General for sending me threats through the mail. I don't exactly know what you're saying, Ralph, but it sounds like it turned out well for you that it sounds like what you're saying is USPS was um, coming to your defense and somehow has gotten your local code enforcement to back off. But if I'm reading that wrong, then I apologize for that. Um, how many law firms have I worked with prior to going independent? Well, it depends on what you mean by that. So when I was in law school, well, when I was in college, I started working with um, Lynn Johnson in Slayton, Michigan, Minnesota, sorry, Slayton, Minnesota. Um, and then um, when I was in law school, I worked for a few law firms. One of them was Thomas B. Shway and Associates. Then um, I worked for Burkholtz Law, and then I worked for Murphy and Young. They were going to merge, and then I, they didn't merge, and I ended up going with the other side. Um, once I moved to Michigan, I worked for um, an attorney who's no longer with us. She passed away, um, Charlotte Allen. And after I was working for her, the only other thing I did was work for myself. I did work with the Great Lakes Justice Center for a period of several years in there. But once I started the Freedom Fight on my own and they didn't want to take um, the Freedom Fight as ferociously as I did, then I haven't done any work with them since 2020. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, Okay, Catherine, question above you missed. Um, why are bar members only recognized as officers of the court and people pro se are not? 
So, okay, so this question, how do I do this? Is there a way that I can, hold on. Okay, I'm gonna show this one. Is it gonna show me? Yes, it's gonna show, okay. So why are bar member, only bar members recognized as officers of the court? I can't speak for other jurisdictions, but what I could tell you is that in the state of Michigan, the Michigan State Bar is, is totally different than the Minnesota State Bar, for example. In Minnesota, the state bar is optional. You can be a licensed attorney and not be a member of the bar. The bar has nothing to do with being um, an attorney per se. In Michigan, it is the state bar that actually issues your attorney registration. It is the state bar who um, it, you know, gives you requirements and things of that nature. It's the state bar. So you have to be a member of the state bar in Michigan <clears throat> in order to be a licensed attorney in the state of Michigan. So with that being said, um, it also, there's a state statute, I think it's in chapter 900 somewhere, but I've referenced it in my briefs in the Allegan County case. So you can certainly find it in there if you're interested. I have a whole section on this and a table of contents in there. Anyway, um, attorneys um, in the state of Michigan, licensed attorneys are actually considered um, government officials. And so because of that, they are considered officers of the court. Um, so government officials are officers in gen, like you think of that government officials, officers, like, so I hope that answers your question. But it, once I understood that, at least how it plays out in the state of Michigan, that made a little bit more sense to me because you wouldn't be an officer of the court. Now you might be an officer in some other respect. You might be a government official at your local township, for example, which I was in the state of Michigan. Um, but that alone didn't make me an officer of the court. Being an attorney did. Um, okay, so how do we combat the chilling effect of public bodies pumping copyrighted music over the speakers and personal phones to prevent or hamper decimation of our videos on platforms such as YouTube? Very good question. I actually haven't personally encountered it myself yet. Um, so here's the, here's the thing. Correct me if I'm wrong, but if you, and I know you don't want to hear this, but if you don't have your video monetized, there's no problem, right? It's not copyrighted because it's, it's a copyright issue when you're making money off of their product. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. I'm going to wait for an answer for that. Cause I, that's a YouTube issue. And, um, I think that's what exists. Um, okay. While I'm okay. So Jay Curvett says, right. So, okay. So assuming that's an answer to my question. So again, you're not going to want to hear this, but my way around it, and this is because I've been doing, I have hundreds, if not thousands of videos online and to help you guys, this is what I am. It's all I'm doing these videos for. And, um, some of them are monetized, but I, I make maybe like, a hundred dollars a year. So I don't know, I, you know, I'm doing it wrong apparently, but at any rate, so for me, if that was the issue, I would turn off monetization for that video and still play the video. And if you want to have another video <clears throat> that kind of like was the prelude or preview to that video, and it kind of had some of the highlights, and then it didn't have the music and it just showed them and you kind of talked about it and you said, okay, so to watch the full video, check this one out. But then the your preview video you have monetized. Maybe that's the way around it. Um, yes, I would say that's an, a way of, of them exercising prior restraint. But at the same time, there are ways around it. As long as I'm correct about it's the monetization issue. So, okay. Is it true that the bar is considered a membership? In other words, you could graduate from law school, however, not choose to become a member of the bar. Okay, so um, I don't know if it's in every single state. So for example, if you go to law school in Wisconsin and you successfully graduate, you don't have to take the bar exam in order to be a member of the state bar. Now, I didn't go to law school in Wisconsin. I lived seven miles from the border. <laughs> so um, I don't know. Uh, I found that out in my third year and it blew my mind. I was like, I 
could have just been living in Green Bay. I'm a Packers fan. This sucks. But anyway, so I don't know if that means that they automatically make you a member of the bar. I know that in Minnesota, they automatically give you a free bar membership for the first year. And they automatically, as soon as you pass the bar exam, you, um, you are, you, they make you a member of the bar for free. And then if you want to renew it after that year, then you can do that or, or not. But um, again, membership is different in states. So the bar itself is generally considered the people who are licensed attorneys. So um, if you graduate from law school, in most states, that does not mean you're a licensed attorney. Like I said, the exception could be something like Wisconsin, where you don't even have to take the bar exam in order to um, be uh, a member of the bar there as long as you went to law school there. But I don't, I don't know anywhere else. Oh, boy. Oh, lots of things. Um, call into the show. It's supposed to be a live call in show. I guess I ended up just answering questions in here. Give me a second because I realize it's almost 1 too. So um, let me see what other. Yeah. Well, Wanda's saying she has 92 videos and she's only getting $132 for over a year. Wanda, I have four years of videos. The first year alone, um, because of all the different events I was speaking at, and it was live streamed and all that, and then the videos I was talking about, the case in the Michigan Supreme Court I was working on, and all that kind of stuff, the petition we were doing. I mean, I, I think I'm closing in on a thousand videos. I could be wrong. It's it's way over 600 videos, but I think I'm closing in on a, maybe a thousand on YouTube alone. And total, I, I have millions of hours of viewing already. I mean, in the first year alone, I, I, it was in the millions of um, viewing hours. And I still somehow get less than $100 a year. So who knows? Um, hmm. Shoot. I had just seen a question and then it scrolled on me. Okay, looks like there's different comments going back and forth. Um, reached out. Okay, I think you're talking to somebody else, not me, so that's fine. Um, okay, so generally specific is wondering about the intent, their intent of using prior restraint to make somebody jump through hoops to scrub the content in order to, you know, get it up on YouTube and use it as they see fit. Um, so when they play music in the background, like they play whatever, Twinkle Twinkle in the background, and they, um, and so that way when they're answering, a public official, a police chief or whoever is answering your questions, but they have that music playing, that's them trying to stop you from you know, having a monetized video on YouTube and getting a lot of viewers and traction and all that kind of stuff. And the question by um, generally specific is how do we address that? How do we stop that kind of prior restraint? I, it's a good question. I haven't thought much about it. I'd love to have a lot more full discussion. Uh, maybe that's something we could talk about on your channel um, when we do a video in a week from now. But um, I, I'm sure there's lots of things to try and do I just don't know that I have the answers off the top of my head right now because this appeal has got me all, you know, upset. So, um, okay. So, okay. Okay. So I think I have answered all the questions, guys. I did not take any specific calls but we answered lots of questions that came in from the chat so um yeah okay so i'm trying to keep my eye on the um i guess i guess i'm going to take this down because this is not accurate today is it um okay go to restorefreedomkh.com resources um, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm going to add a new one guys. Cause I was going to explain to you how you get to the other one from there. Uh, 
Okay. Did it do it? Did it do it? Here we go. Go to this link. RestoreFreedomKH.com slash OB case. That's going to give you all the stuff um, on this case, the short little video, the link to be able to donate, um, all the documents that we have submitted at all levels of the courts so far. Um, like I said, except for the two that I resubmitted again today, but the text and the page numbers is the same as what you saw in the others. It's the bookmarks and the index. Those are the things that basically have changed. Um, the one thing I will say to you is if you use Adobe Acrobat Viewer and you are interested in looking at um, the appendix and, and the transcript specifically, it's the transcript that looks like garbledy gook only with Adobe. So I have a different viewer and I can see it just fine. And other people that have different viewers can see it just fine. I've had people check multiple viewers. They could see it just fine. But Adobe specifically, you can't read the, the transcript with the version that I have on the website later, hopefully today, but maybe by tomorrow, I will have it updated and point to the new one um, that Adobe can read. So interesting that Adobe Reader can't read a PDF. Um, so I didn't show the call-in number today because um, it's now 1.30 and um, there, I was thinking you guys were going to be checking out at this point. But um, okay, so Rodney says an interesting comment. Oops. I, the problem I see with the whole deal is that the government owns all lawyers with the license to practice law. They don't own me. I'll tell you that. I'm licensed to practice in the state of Michigan, the Eastern District Federal Court, West, uh, Eastern District of Michigan, the Western District Federal Court in Michigan, and the United States Supreme Court, as well as the Saginaw Chippewa Tribal Court, which is in the Mount Pleasant, Michigan area. I'm licensed, I'm admitted in all of those. I'm Pro Hoc Vice admitted in the um, Florida uh, Middle District, um, Federal District Court down here. but no one none of them own me no one owns me but unfortunately a lot of attorneys look at the court and they look at the bar as the end all be all of oh well this is just the way we do things yeah i gotta make sure that i don't make anybody mad or ruffle any feathers or whatever and they don't they don't remember to look at the constitution first and really know and study it. I don't care what kind of an attorney you are. If you're a divorce attorney, criminal law attorney, um, if you draft contracts, if you represent landlords or tenants or whatever, public defender, whatever you do. I, and I myself probably said that at some point. Oh, I'm not a constitutional attorney, so I don't really know the answer to that. That is always the wrong thing to say because if you're an attorney at all, you should know the Constitution, and you definitely should know the parts of the Constitution that your practice has anything to do with. Now, if you don't know family law, because you mostly do criminal, and you don't know anything about family law, and so you don't really know how the other constitutional part, you know, the parts of the Constitution uh, interplay with, like, family law issues, that makes sense. But that's more of a specific subject. But Constitution law is, is something everybody that's an attorney must no. And if you work in the courts, you should have to know it too. Um, okay. So, sorry. Wow. Lots of stuff coming back and forth. Um, I think I'm getting it all. I'm just trying to scan through these. Um, Oh, yeah, I certainly lost the good graces of several courts when, um, you know, when I would be a public defender and I would defend people. And I would file the motions and I would request discovery and I would go to the hearings and I would fight appropriately and within the rules. Um, same thing when I was a guardian ad litem, when I was a lawyer guardian ad litem in Florida, or excuse me, in Michigan, they combined the roles. So um, I was a lawyer guardian ad litem for children in abuse and neglect cases. And, you know, most guardians ad litem, uh, LGALs, most LGALs in Michigan, they don't have specialized training. In fact, they didn't really make sure that I had specialized training before I 
started taking those cases and got assigned those cases, but I had been trained as a lawyer for children and as a guardian ad litem for children by the state of uh, state of Minnesota Supreme Court, because they have a very thorough training system and the needs and rights of children and the needs and rights of parents and, you know, the intersection of them and everything else. So um, at any rate, there's, yeah, I would make sure that I, whatever role I was in, I was advocating for my client, especially when it was a child, especially when it was a child who couldn't speak, that I didn't care what the social worker said. I don't care what their investigation turned up. I went and looked at the house myself. I went and spoke to the principal myself. I went and spoke to the teachers and the counselors and the neighbors and the grandparents and the foster parents and the bio parents and the child. And I reviewed the documents and I looked at the court records and I looked at the prescription records and I looked at the medical charts and I reviewed things myself. I never took a social worker's word for it. And that's something that will make sure that you are not in the good graces of some judges because they want the case to be more easy and less combative, steamrolling. So yeah, I I didn't play that game. <laughs> so anyway, um, Oh, not all GALs are bad. I have always been a phenomenal GAL, but um, haven't done those cases now in, I don't know, five or 10 years. Okay, so. Okay, I think I now have all the questions. It's It's not quite like it's being sticky about how it's scrolling. So I think I have answered all the questions. Um, we didn't take calls, but um, whew, today might've been a bad day for, I mean, I have to be super patient with my hearing disability. I have to make sure that I'm like catching all the words right. And I'm asking clarification questions and doing all this stuff. And sometimes the person is also texting me so I can like read what they're saying. Anyway, today would not have been a day for me to have to exercise that much diligence and patience and being able to answer your questions while I was super fired up about my own case. So thanks for being patient with me and understanding as to why we changed up the format and I didn't take the calls. I had the I had the the calling um, app open this whole time and ready to go. And we played the phone number at the beginning of the of the show and it, it typically has stayed the same um, unless we've had a technical difficulty in the in the first few shows where we had to switch the phone number. But anyway. Um, So let's see. Um, <laughs> the odds of getting someone like Catherine as a GAL are the same odds as Angelina Jolie picking me up for lunch. I'm going to take that as a compliment. Um, in fact, I need to, I need to find that in here. What's going on? Nothing is working. Oh, come on. Technical difficulties. Yeah, it's like, it's being stupid. I don't know what it's doing. My computer's doing all kinds of things. Um, but that was, I just really liked that, um, that comment. So there we go. That one. And it's so awesome. I think I'm going to take this and move it back up here. Okay. Awesome. So anyway, um, yeah, love that comment. <laughs> so, um, thank you for the, the well wishes for my appeal. Um, yeah, for me answering questions today. Awesome. Um, and yes, if you honor is everything, it really, it really is. Um, Yes, I forget to do some of the basics and ask you to hit that um, like button, the thumbs up button, uh, whether you're watching on Facebook or Rumble or YouTube right now. Um, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already subscribed. Make sure you hit that notification button if you don't have notifications um, already set up. Um, now, you, if you do have notifications set up, hopefully they've been working the last two times because I switched back to my original software, um, Streamlabs. 
And, um, and so I have other limitations, like each one of these programs has good stuff, but then it has bad stuff. So this one is the only way where I could take the calls and um, I can actually show chat. I found a way around it to show chat this time. Yay me. Um, and whatnot. But, you know, my my face is small and the chat is huge and it, whatever. Like there's, I just, I can't do anything about some of these things. Um, but I don't know where I was going. I was saying something about um, one of the deficiencies here. Um, anyway. Um, oh, doing it through this way, one of the benefits was because then you do supposedly get notifications. So hopefully those were working for you guys this time. Um, anyway, so hit that like button, subscribe, um, share. Please hit the share button. Tell people about this video. Share it into your um, YouTube community. Share it on Facebook. Share it on Twitter, whatever. Um, oh, I think I might be live streaming on Twitter today. I might have included it this time. Um, anyway, uh, just for fun. And um, <clears throat> do make sure that if you have the opportunity to um, support us financially in any way, whether you feel passionate about these kinds of um, issues that I'm working on in this appeal and you want to help fund the thousands of dollars we've already had to pour into that and are continuing to pay for that, um, please do so. Um, that link is available at givesendgo.com slash save Henry home. But it's also, um, you can see it on that uh, restorefreedomkh.com uh, slash OB case. There's a link right in there. Um, or if you just want to be able to donate, um, whether it's $5, whether it's $50, whether it's $500 or $5,000, I could use all the help that I could get um, because all this work has been done um, for free. And um, I... Um, I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm just hitting all kinds of buttons here. Um, anyway, Lori has both links, but the other link, if you want to be able to donate, is um, Restore Freedom. I Apparently, it doesn't let me show those, so I'm going to go. One is the OB case. That's the way you can donate specifically for that case. You can go there. Otherwise, you can go to restorefreedomkh.com slash donate, and you can donate to all the other kinds of things we do. You can um, also go to the shop link um restorefreedomkh.com slash shop and you can get our um our window clings or our car magnets or the pop sockets these really cool um pop sockets oops which i just turned upside down anyway all that fun stuff so um please consider doing that um all those items by the way i don't make money on i already paid for them out of pocket and it's just going to help replenish that fund uh, because we're just selling it to you for what we paid for it, what it takes for us to ship it to you. That's it. There's no money made. Um, it's just helping us in that way. So anyway, um, yes, um, hopefully I was able to answer all of your questions. Um, I think um, I got everybody. So if I did... Um, Um, if I did miss any comments or questions here, I apologize. Um, I did my best to keep up. You guys are awesome in the chat today, keeping that really going strong. So um, do make sure to join us. Um, next week, I will be on the Generally Specific channel for their show High Noon at noon on the 16th, uh, talking about some of these issues and more. And I'm sure I'll be on Direct D's channel at some point soon, too. I think that's going to be the third Thursday of the month. Um, Thursday. Yeah, I think on a Thursday. Um, I think at 8 p.m., 7 p.m. Um, I don't know. Um, anyway, he'll post about that, I'm sure. And um, I will be back for the uh, the next real true call, uh, call-in show uh, uh, in two weeks. So the fourth Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m. That's our evening show. So we catch those people that don't have a chance to call in during the day or be uh, participating in a live chat during the day. Um, so 7 p.m. for our next show here on this channel in two weeks from today. Please join us for that. And uh, thanks so much for all you guys do in your own way to fight for freedom and to support the work that we are doing. It's all very much appreciated. Um, and with that, if I know what buttons I'm supposed to press at which places, I'm going to sign off and um, 
Wish you guys all a wonderful day. Our work to restore freedom would not be possible without support from people just like you. From the various software and hardware needed to the legal research materials, every dollar you can donate helps. Make sure to like and share this video too. And remember to follow and subscribe and click that notification button. Together, we can restore freedom.